tres. Uno, dos, tres. One, two, three. Uno, dos, tres. Está. No le veo. Ah, no, está bien. One, two, three. One, two, three. Uno, dos, tres. Uno, dos, tres. Se oye, ¿verdad? Se oye allá atrás. ¿Se oye allá atrás? ¿Sí? Perfecto. Bueno, Arracha León, Jano Tandreo, Ongi Torri, buenas días, buenas tardes y bienvenido a todas las personas que habéis accedido a este acto, a este diálogo, a esta reunión. Podemos llamar de muchas maneras. Eh, Sabéis que en castellano entiendo que va a ser el número 3 mm, o 4, no estoy muy seguro, 4, número 4 en castellano. En inglés va a ser el número 2. Ok, uno o dos, one or two for you. Um, primero quería agradecer a todo el mundo que, que habéis acudido hoy aquí y desear que sea de interés eh, para vosotros este acto. Eh, yo os hablo como soy Joaquín Fuentes, eh, soy médico psiquiatra infantil y acudo no como psiquiatra infantil, sino como miembro de la Junta Directiva de, no lucrativa del el teléfono de la Esperanza. Y para mí es un placer el representar al teléfono de la esperanza y decir un, algunas cositas sobre el, el teléfono de la esperanza y un poco sobre lo que vamos a tratar hoy. El, el teléfono de esperanza, ¿se oye? Sí. El teléfono de la esperanza, 900-840-845. 900-840-845. Eh, lleva 32 años de funcionamiento en Guipúzcoa. Se dice pronto, pero son 32 años. Y en este último año, en el 2018, eh, puedo señalar que hemos recibido 2.560 llamadas. Eh, está abierto 305 días al año, todo el año. Eh, y son siempre personas voluntarias, formadas y que están reformadas progresivamente, las que atienden, los que son las personas escuchas. De manera que creo que es una iniciativa muy interesante. Hemos visto recientemente que hay una paridad mayor de sexo. De las 2.500 personas que han llamado, 58% son mujeres y un 42% son hombres. Esto es un cambio con respecto a lo que ha sido lo tradicional, con una preponderancia femenina. De manera que los hombres nos estamos soltando, se ve a comunicar y a hablar. Se puede llamar al teléfono por muchos motivos. Pero el más frecuente de todos es la soledad y la incomunicación, que tiene que ver con el 26% de las llamadas. La mayor parte de las personas que llaman son de la provincia, 71%, 18% de Donosti, San Sebastián, y solo 11% de personas de fuera. Las edades máximas son de los 51 a los 60, 40%. Luego vienen 61, 70, 22% y más de 71, 14%. Que quizás no es un número tan elevado como debería de ser. Eh, ¿Por qué? Porque nosotros, todo el mundo sabe que aquí tenemos eh, una edad media de la población en Guipúzcoa de 45,8 años. De manera que somos una población bastante mayor, media. Tenemos eh, por cada menor, tenemos... Dos mayores, o sea, por cada dos, perdón, por cada menor de 15 años hay dos personas mayores de 65. De manera que este es un poco el desequilibrio que hay de las edades de población. Por cierto, que leí hace poco que en Madrid hay más perros que niños de menos de 5 años. Es más fácil encontrar perros en la calle que niños pequeños. Lo cual quiere decir que no estamos solos en estos cambios demográficos que son tan importantes. En Euskadi sabemos que tres de cada diez personas viven solas y eso es un número que va creciendo también en toda Europa, el número de personas que viven solas, que no quiere decir que sea un problema, simplemente es una característica que nos obliga a repensar nuestra situación personal y social. Sabemos por un estudio de Bacardedac, de la Fundación Matía, que el 5.5% 
de los guipuzcoanos mayores de 55 se sienten solos. Y estoy seguro que nos van a explicar en la, en la conferencia, en la charla, la diferencia entre soledad deseada o recogimiento, aislamiento, que es otro concepto, y la soledad no deseada, que es lo que nos trae hoy aquí. Yo creo que eh, quizás el país que peor ejemplo da a todo el mundo, pero que quizás es el más sincero de todos, es el Japón. Y a mí me parece que los números que tienen son impresionantes. Ellos llaman al kodokushi, que es morirse solitario en casa, sin que nadie sepa que, que uno se ha muerto y lo encuentra la policía, los bomberos, los vecinos por el olor, etc. El kodokushi están 30.000 casos cada año en Japón de personas que mueren solas en sus casas. 80% son hombres. Y de eso nos hablarán también del mayor riesgo de aislamiento, de soledad de los hombres mayores versus de los hombres versus las mujeres. No todos son mayores, por cierto, también hay gente de mediana edad. Pero lo que es llamativo es que en el Japón el gobierno ha establecido que el 20% de los crímenes los cometen las personas mayores para ir a la cárcel y poder estar asegurada la compañía y la comida, por no ser pobres. Lo cual creo yo que es sobrecogedor. Esperemos no llegar allí. Y para no llegar allí hay muchas iniciativas, eh, ciertamente, entre nosotros. Nosotros, eh, este año, siempre atendemos cosas como la soledad en el teléfono de la esperanza. Pero dijimos, bueno, ¿y este año por qué no damos una medida un poco más proactiva? En vez de responder a los que llaman porque se sienten solos, ¿por qué no tratamos de organizar algo que disminuya la soledad en nuestra sociedad? Y aquí eh, este es el origen, básicamente, de esta, de esta conferencia. Es parte del ciclo de conferencias que hacemos cada año de relevancia social y que nos permite conectar con la ciudadanía y con las jornadas que vamos a hacer mañana. Porque esto solo es el primer plato, el primer plato que tiene nuestra invitada de hoy, que luego presentaré. Eh, mañana tenemos todo un día una jornada de trabajo en Tabacalera, un grupo de 70 profesionales, 70 personas, 70 voluntarios, 70 personas que tienen que ver con estos aspectos de las relaciones sociales y la comunidad. Y a mí la lista me parece un tesoro, y no me puedo privar de leer el tesoro, porque creo que representa lo mejor de Guipúzcoa, dicho con todo cariño. Tendremos allí trabajando todo el día a personas del Departamento de Política Social, del Departamento de Cultura, Cooperación, Juventud y Deportes de la Diputación Foral. Tendremos del Ayuntamiento Donostia Lagún Collá, Servicio de Personas Mayores y Discapacidad, Centros de Mayores de Donostia y Guardia Municipal, lo cual me parece excelente. Tendremos de ayuntamientos de otros, de otros sitios de Quipuzcoa, Zarauz, Hernani, Oñati, Peizama, que también van a mandar guardias municipales y acción social, servicios sociales. Tenemos 21 asociaciones, que se dice pronto, Adinberri, Adinquide, Euskadi Lagunco Ya, Afagi, Agifes, Aptes, Aubisha, Caritas, Cruz Roja, El Dua Cadí, Emaús Fundación Social, Fundación Urcoa, Fundación Isan, Programa Norbera, Fundación Zorroaga, Gautena, Iches, Asociación de Mujeres Rurales, Urcoa, Instituto Matía, Fundación A, Nagusilán, Paliativos, Sin Fronteras y Why Not. Y tenemos otros, otras iniciativas como son Orona, Fundación A, de Orona, la Fundación Policlínica de Ipuzcoa, Suma Aldapeta, Técnica, Ubic, y, por supuesto, la UPV Euskal Rico Universidad TEA. Yo creo que el haber juntado a todas estas personas a establecer las bases de cómo luchar contra la soledad actual y futura en, en Guipúzcoa, creo que es un, un auténtico lujo y una gran oportunidad para todos nosotros. Y me parece que es, que es estupendo el poder dar esta información y estamos todos deseando trabajar mañana con nuestra invitada. Eh, hoy nos, nos acompaña en esta apertura Belén Larrión, que es la directora general de Protección a la Infancia e Inserción Social de la Fundación de, perdón, de la Diputación Foral de Quipúzcoa, y a la que me gustaría dejarle que me, la posibilidad de saludarnos. Belén, bienvenida. Es que regasco. Millasker, Joaquín. Eh, Arracha León, Gertura Tosareten Gustioy. 
Itxaropen telefonoari gonbitea, eskertzea, gaur zuekin itzaldi hau konpartitzea aukera izatea gati. Bueno, decía que buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Agradecer en primer lugar al teléfono de la esperanza la oportunidad, que no es la primera vez, ya llevamos años, que nos brindáis, ¿no? Esta oportunidad que nos dais a la Diputación Foral y en concreto al Departamento de Políticas Sociales eh, de compartir, y en este caso esta tarde, esta conferencia que sin duda nos va a aportar muchos elementos para la reflexión sobre la soledad. Pero no cualquier soledad, sino la soledad que no queremos, que no deseamos y que a veces nos toca sobrellevar cuando no soportar. Eh, el teléfono de la Esperanza y el Departamento de Políticas Sociales de la Diputación Foral de Guipúzcoa, mediante un convenio de colaboración, llevan años eh, bueno, pues colaborando y trabajando por, el, por un objeto como es el apoyo y el acompañamiento personal de personas que se encuentran en soledad. Eh, llevan haciendo proyectos, distintos proyectos, o llevamos colaborando en distintos proyectos que eh, tienen como fin favorecer escenarios que propicien desde la solidaridad y desde el voluntariado, pero no cualquier voluntariado, sino un voluntariado organizado, formado, que propicien espacios para escuchar, y no escuchar tampoco de cualquier forma, sino escuchar de una manera activa, eh, contener y apoyar a aquellas personas que así lo solicitan, así como también eh, quiero reconocer el trabajo que se hace de sensibilizar, informar y apoyar a distintos agentes de nuestra comunidad, de nuestra sociedad, en temas tan interesantes y tan importantes como el que hoy nos ha traído y nos ocupa. Eh, este teléfono, que no es cualquier teléfono, sino que es el de la esperanza, tiene la virtud de llegar desde lo individual y desde lo íntimo a lo más grupal y lo más comunitario. Eh, la, Diputación, la Diputación Foral de Guipúzcoa puso en marcha eh, ya en la legislatura anterior, ya llevamos unos años, con una iniciativa que habréis escuchado, que es Etorquizuna Eraikis. Eh, esta iniciativa tiene el fin, con, se, se, se puso en marcha con el fin de fortalecer eh, la capacidad que ya tiene nuestro territorio para hacer frente precisamente a los retos de futuro. Y la soledad no deseada es esto, es un reto social de futuro. Y así lo entendemos en Guipúzcoa. Y como tal, estamos trabajando de una manera colaborativa a través de esta iniciativa de Torquizunaraikis en una investigación sobre las personas en riesgo de exclusión, en situación de exclusión social y eh, la soledad no deseada. Este proyecto, que está coliderado por diferentes, el Teléfono de la Esperanza, Cáritas, Emaús, Fundación Social y el Departamento de Psicología de la Universidad del País Vasco. Pues bien, Etorquiz eh, nos permite construir conocimiento, conocimiento de forma compartida y poner en marcha iniciativas entre diferentes con proyección siempre de futuro. En este sentido y en el marco del apoyo que el Departamento de Políticas Sociales realiza a la iniciativa social guipuzcoana, colabora también con el teléfono de la esperanza en el objeto de estas jornadas que tienen lugar hoy y que también, como decía Joaquín, eh, continúan mañana por la mañana. Es decir, en la construcción de ese espacio de reflexión sobre la soledad, no cualquier soledad, sino sobre la soledad no deseada. Buscando un trabajo en red, propiciando el diálogo entre personas y entidades diferentes, implicadas e interesadas en el silencioso pero hondo problema que supone la soledad no deseada. Pues bien, estamos en construcción como suele decirse, la reflexión precisa de espacios tanto mentales como espaciales. Y la soledad no deseada ya ha ocupado ese espacio también para la Diputación Foral de Guipúzcoa. Vesteri Gabe, 
itzaldi oparo eta aberatze izango dugulakoan danok mila esker denoi. Eskerrik asko, eskerrik asko Belén, y gracias por el apoyo de la Diputación a la realización de, esta, de estas jornadas. Valoramos mucho el apoyo general y el apoyo puntual de la Diputación. De la misma manera que también valoramos la colaboración y el apoyo del Diario Vasco, eh, que es muy importante en nuestra sociedad gipuzcoana. Creo que se me ha olvidado citar a un grupo que mañana van a venir y que son fundamentales. Si no lo he olvidado, me da igual, lo repito, porque son muy importantes para todos nosotros. Es el grupo de Osakidecha. Van a venir la red de atención primaria de Osakidecha, el OSI Donosti Aldea, Coordinación Sociosanitaria y Enfermería, el OASI de Alto Deva de Enfermería y el Programa de Prevención de Conducta Suicida de Guipúzcoa. De manera que los tenemos a todos. A todos realmente. Y creo que eso es estupendo. Muy bien. Eh, yo no quiero que dediquemos más tiempo a la presentación, sino que pasemos directamente al acto. Me gustaría solicitar que tuvieran el teléfono como yo, apagado. Apaguen, por favor, los teléfonos. Se puede apagar y se debe apagar. Y hoy vamos a hablar de comunicación, así que no queremos teléfonos eh, que interrumpan. Y como vamos a hablar de comunicación, pues el, el objetivo no es darles a todos ustedes una charla, una conferencia, sino que queríamos dar ejemplo, dar ejemplo de comunicación hablando, haciendo un diálogo. Y esa va a ser el, la manera en la que vamos a proceder. Eh, vamos a tener dos personas que van a dialogar por su cuenta y luego al final tendremos algunos minutos de, de preguntas o de opiniones o de contribuciones de ustedes. Esperemos que les lleguen los traductores. Nos hemos encontrado que hay menos aparatos de lo que esperábamos aquí. Entonces, eh, si a alguien no le llega, pues lo sentimos. Y si hay alguien que se maneja bien en inglés, que lo deje otra vez para que alguien lo pueda, lo pueda acoger. Eh, tenemos a dos personas, les decía. Una de ellas es Lourdes Pérez. Lourdes Pérez, que es licenciada en periodismo. Ella pasó por Antena 3 Radio, encontrado en Radio Bilbao, Cadena Ser, Radio Euskadi, luego por el correo. Fue nombrada jefa de opinión de la Dirección de Contenidos Editoriales de Botadito y desde febrero de 2010 ha sido primero jefa de redacción del Diario Vasco para pasar a lo que ahora es subdirectora del Diario Vasco. Yo creo que Lourdes es apreciada como una persona para las tertulias en numerosos medios y por numerosas personas. Y creo que es reconocida, sinceramente, por su exquisita dedicación a los aspectos de mejora de nuestra sociedad. Creo que es un placer y un orgullo el poder contar con ella como una de las personas que va a dialogar. La otra persona es Kate Shurety. Kate Shurety es la directora ejecutiva de la campaña contra la soledad del Reino Unido. Es una organización sin ánimo de lucro que junto con otras iniciativas comunitarias generó que el gobierno británico estableciera en octubre de 2018 bajo el mandato de Theresa May el primer ministerio de la soledad de Europa iniciativa que luego ha sido copiada en otros países Kate tiene 20 años de experiencia como profesional de la comunicación y ha liderado campañas de mentalización y de mejoras sociosanitarias tanto en el campo público como el del tercer sector. Es una persona comprometida con el uso del diseño basado en las personas para guiarnos en la innovación. Y creo que es una frase ejemplar que ya he dicho en una ocasión. Utilizar a las personas para guiarnos en la innovación. Así que, sin más, eh, es un auténtico placer el tenerlas aquí y yo les invito a subir a la mesa y dialogar, dialogar para nosotros. Muchas gracias. Arracha el león, te amo y es que de torche a ti, que espero que se me haya pasado el rubor. Um, qué generosísima presentación, qué bonito que le digan a una estas cosas en, aquí, delante de, de tanta gente y de tantos amigos. Gracias, querido Joaquín. Gracias a Maribel también. Es un honor para mí que, 
el teléfono de la esperanza. Nada menos que el teléfono de la esperanza. La esperanza es una palabra singularmente bonita, singularmente hermosa, aunque a veces puede ser traicionera que haya sido el teléfono de la esperanza quien haya pensado en mí para a presentar eh, este coloquio. Primero la introducción que hará la, la ponente y luego el coloquio que, como bien ha dicho Joaquín, dejará un espacio para las preguntas. Yo siempre digo que la única pregunta impertinente es la que uno se lleva a su casa. Entonces, no se las lleven a casa, háganlas aquí, que luego da rabia porque en casa se la puedo hacer uno a quien tiene al lado, pero no van a tener a Kate para que se las conteste. Eh, esta jornada afronta un problema identificado como tal en nuestros días, es decir, como un problema, que es la soledad no deseada, pero que nos remite, yo lo llamaría una punzada del sentimiento tan antigua como la humanidad. Dejó escrito Gustavo Adolfo Becker que la soledad es muy hermosa cuando se tiene junto a alguien a quien decírselo. Y el infierno son los otros, vino a oponer Jean-Paul Sartre casi un siglo más tarde. Se ha generado mucha literatura en torno a la soledad del hombre, bastante menos en torno a la soledad de las mujeres, como ocurre con todos los grandes dilemas del ser humano, con todo lo que nos afecta en lo que nos es más íntimo y lo que nos es más personal y en lo que tiene que ver con nuestra relación con los demás. La soledad se ha revestido en no pocas ocasiones con el romanticismo filosófico de quienes la han presentado como el único estadio posible que permite ser verdaderamente libre, que nos permitiría ser verdaderamente únicos. Pero hoy sabemos que la soledad que no se busca o la soledad que no se es impuesta puede provocar un dolor devastador, con consecuencias además para el conjunto de la sociedad. La, sociedad, la soledad se convierte en un mal social cuando miles de nuestros mayores han dejado de, poner, de poder comunicarse con sus semejantes y algunos de ellos llegan a morir tan abandonados a su suerte como para que nadie se percate de ella en meses e incluso en años. Y cuando hay jóvenes en la veintena, es decir, hiperconectados a través de las redes sociales, que no sienten que puedan contar con nadie cuando atraviesan un trance vital complejo o delicado. Reza el currículum de nuestra invitada esta tarde, que es una experta en soledad, lo que yo diría que es casi como una conocedora del alma humana. ¿Quién es? Ya lo ha dicho. Bueno, ha dicho no tanto quién es, sino a qué se dedica, que suelen ser dos cosas distintas. Eh, Joaquín, yo así añadiré que nuestra ponente no solo cree que la, sociedad, que la soledad perdón, ha de revelarse como un área de interés para la política y las instituciones, también que ha de generarse una gran conversación nacional, y la expresión me gusta mucho, sobre la soledad. Welcome, Ken Shoretti. It's really a pleasure being here with you this afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you, and, and thank you to Telephone of Hope and everyone who's made my You know, this has been such a welcoming experience coming here to the Basque country, and um, and and it's and it's also really interesting from my perspective to um, to hear how loneliness is such an issue here. It's a massive issue in the United Kingdom, and it's something we've been fighting to have recognised at policy level for almost 10 years now. Um, and it's and it's just always really good to see other people taking that on, and and I think always the lesson is that, that there has to be some way of working out how you make those changes to make people less lonely in a, in a context that's, that's appropriate to your own culture, to your own people and the own way of life. So thank you very much. I'm, I feel very privileged to be here. Pensaba que iba a haber algún tipo de presentación de vídeo. Prefiero entrar directamente... Entramos directamente al coloquio. Sí. I can do the video. Yeah. So yeah. So the, this first video is the video that we produced um, about two and a half years ago, and it was it was it was designed to capture what it is to be lonely in in later life, mm -hmm. when maybe your opportunities to rekindle connections or to to start new friendships and new relationships is a bit more diminished. And we know that you know almost half of people aged 75 plus that are living on their own do not speak to anybody for five or six days a week, and the human cost and the human pain of that. So this is this was an experiment um, that was done. We created a video to try and capture the impact of that. Bear with me. I'm sorry, I find it quite difficult.
still early doors, but so far it's been uh, remarkably quiet. I can hear the uh, people in the neighbouring flats heading out in the hallway. I'll have to do something a bit more exciting, I imagine. I'm quite jealous of that. It's almost like I'm not mentally prepared for bed because there's not been a beginning, middle and end. It's just been a, a, a constant nothingness. I'm just counting down the hours now. And I've just kind of gone into robot mode. If you start overthinking things, you start thinking about how lonely you are. I'm supposed to do the video diaries, but... Oh, I don't know what to say. It's not something you think about, is it, until it actually happens to you. I was bereaved. Right. Two and a half years ago. Oh, right. Not having someone to talk to, to hug, to share things with. The more elderly people, particularly, it's part of life. Mm. I can promise you that it can be devastating. Probably the key would be to, to be aware of people, to talk to someone of that, in that situation who is lonely. You have to. Really, it requires a little effort. Kate, when or what le motiva usted eh, a preocuparse por la soledad? ¿En qué momento una se sienta en la vida? Y dice, esto es un problema social que a mí me preocupa. No sé si proviene de una experiencia personal eh, o de una inquietud colectiva que usted percibe en su actividad eh, profesional o personal cotidiana. So, um, so the campaign started almost 10 years ago and, and that came about because there were four chief executives of different charity organizations um, working with older people, working with dis disabled people, and they decided what was needed um, because a lot of their services and a lot of the focus of their activities was on people who were lonely and that this was an underlying problem that didn't have any focus. So they created the campaign. I came later. Um, and, and from my own personal experience, I think um, in common with many people, that period between the age of 18 and 25 is one of a lot of change. It's one of a lot of identity um, challenge to oneself personally. And that's when people often feel very acutely lonely. Um, my background is an, as an anthropologist. So basically, I believe we are all incredibly social beings. Biologically, we need social connections in order to thrive. And, and this is something that I have seen in my work in healthcare and my work in education. So my work in healthcare, I worked in an acute hospital in London, um, and there'd often be people who had no English and how they would transition from being patients back into their community, or elderly people who, whose family had moved away. Loneliness and isolation was a really strong theme in, in the healthcare environment. And when I worked in education, I was working in tertiary education, so 18 to 25-year-olds. And again, the changes and the challenges that they, those young people were facing um, often centered around loneliness, um, unwanted loneliness in particular. So um, when I had the opportunity to join the campaign and become a part of the campaign, it absolutely made sense to me from an intellectual perspective, but also from a personal and an emotional perspective that this is where... This is where we need to focus a lot of attention um, to create change. ¿Se ha sentido usted alguna vez profundamente sola? ¿Le da miedo la soledad? Profundamente sola, no queriendo estar sola. Yes, no, no, absolutely. Um, and again, it was it, my most challenging time would have been going to university at the age of 18. Um, I, I'd come from a particular part of London that um, and then I moved to a very upper class university I don't know how to explain this in Spanish but the class the class distinctions in England felt particularly strong to me at that point and I felt very much an outsider so it took me a long time to 
get over those prejudices within myself and also to break down the prejudices of those around me as well and to find common ground and to create really lasting friendships. So that was, that was a point I think I most acutely felt lonely. Um, other times as well, when, when I became a parent for the first time and, and the usual social engagements I would be involved in, I wasn't anymore because I had a small baby. Um, as I've got older, I probably feel lonely less, but that's quite common, I think. Um, when you have children and you have older parents and you have those responsibilities, their solitude, you, you kind of want the desired solitude more than you can get it. ¿Y usted hablaba de ello? ¿Por qué no hablamos de la soledad? ¿Por qué la soledad sigue siendo un tabú y carga con un, una especie de estigma social? It, it definitely has a stigma. Um, and I think it's because um, it's, it's seen, if you, if you admit that you feel lonely, um, it's seen as a weakness, it's seen as maybe a failure, a failure to make the right kind of relationships and connections. So if you're saying you're lonely, you're either saying that you need more, you're a needy person, um, or, or that you're not fully functional, fully functional as a social being. So I think there's a great stigma, and it's really good, I think, that people are beginning to talk about the fact that they feel lonely, because often that's a step to becoming more integrated with the rest of the community again. Ustedes llevan trabajando una década eh, con, la, con la campaña. ¿Qué han descubierto en estos diez años? ¿Qué le ha sorprendido del trabajo de campo que han hecho? Um, ¿Qué prejuicios que podían tener ustedes o ideas preconcebidas sobre cómo opera la soledad se le han derrumbado un poco con lo que ha podido experimentar eh, eso más a pie de obra? So at the Campaign to End Loneliness, we, we focus on older people in particular um, and people who are, who are experiencing constant loneliness. And I think that's quite different. So I think in common with many people, probably my age, my experience, um, the, the very acute loneliness of youth is something that's very familiar to me. My daughter is 23, so I've seen her go through that transition as well. Um, but I think there is a tendency um, in our society, and I don't think it's a good tendency at all, to ignore what happens when people get older and to, to not try and connect with that. Um, there's a lot of fear and a lot of, a, a lot of concern, um, but, it, but I think, for me, one of the surprising things is, is just how, how many things can happen to you later in life that can compound and make that loneliness almost insurmountable. So, you know, you may finish work, start retirement, you, you then lose your friends um, or your connections through your profession or your career. Um, in England, many people move, move house at that point as well. They might move to the seaside or they might move closer to their children. Their children might then move again and then they're suddenly in a new environment. Um, their partner may become ill, they may become carers, um, they may be bereaved, they may get divorced. So all of these kind of relationship issues in, in, at a point when you're, not, when you're not working, when you're not connected back into the rest of society that values people as working people can mean that it's very hard to kind of reform connections and to, to, create, to create more... More, more, more meaningful connections in your own life. So, so constant loneliness is particularly bad from a health perspective, and I think that's what surprised me most, is when you have this kind of compounding situation, um, it, it can stop you from eating healthily, you might stop exercising, you don't go out very much, um, you may smoke more, um, you sleep more poorly, and you're more, more you're basically your immune response comes down as well, just, just from being lonely. Um, and not being around other people. And this these combination of the, all these impacts is equivalent to almost 15 cigarettes a day. So it's, it's, that was probably the most surprising thing, was the very real, tangible health impact that constant loneliness can have. ¿Eso está cuantificado? Eh, usted que trabajó para, para el Servicio eh, de Salud Británico, ¿hay cantidades... Eh, asignadas a lo que 
al coste personal y para el conjunto del sistema que supone la soledad? So the NHS hasn't done any research on this as yet, um, although there are lots of researchers around Britain doing research. Um, the 15 cigarettes a day and some of the other impacts that it has on physiology, that's um, mostly been done by American researchers. So um, a woman called Julian holt Bumstart from the Brigham Young University, and also John Capiocci, who, who, the late John Capiocci, who did a lot of work in this area, and also showed that there were some really strong connections, loneliness with Alzheimer's, dementia, and, and other kind of conditions. Mm -hmm. Pero digamos que no se ha hecho un estudio que lo cuantifique, ¿no? Como se ha podido hacer con el tabaco, por ejemplo, salvando las, las distancias. Aquí tampoco, ¿eh? No, no, no existe, no, no tengo yo en mente que que nuestro sistema de salud haya hecho un estudio transversal sobre eh, los costes sanitarios que comporta la, la soledad. So we did we did some research on this um, about five years ago. So that was before mm. I joined the campaign. And and that what that research showed is that for every pound spent in preventing loneliness, you would save three pounds in the local economy. So if somebody is feeling isolated and they're not um, involved in their local community, they're less likely to be spending money in their local community, less likely to be making other connections um, that will also generate economic activity. So there is, there is a direct mm -hmm. cost link that has, been, that has been shown when you do the opposite, but not how much it costs when somebody is, is lonely, if that makes sense. ¿Cómo definiría la soledad no deseada? ¿Qué ingredientes tiene exactamente esa soledad para que eh, acabe convirtiéndose en un problema individual y social? So, um, we define loneliness in a very specific way. So, um, we can talk about solitude, which is, I think, what Becca was referring to, the wanted loneliness, that, that lovely respite when you... You have three, three, tribe, three, three types of yeah, words. Three types, yeah, three types of words. <laughs> <laughs> And... Um, And then the second would be social isolation. So that would be somebody, um, somebody experiencing social isolation would be experiencing exclusion, maybe because they have a disability, maybe through poverty, um, or maybe a lack of mobility, um, just, or geographic, you know, maybe they're in a very difficult to reach place. So these things are quite objective, um, but you could be socially isolated and completely happy or content with that. Um, loneliness is when you are discontented. It's when the quality or the quantity of the relationships in your life are less than you want them to be. So it's all about the subjective discontent of, of that, really. That's, that's how we define loneliness. Um, and in terms of, you, you said, how much is that a, a, a problem? I think, you know, we all will experience loneliness. It's completely normal. There sh it shouldn't be stigmatized in that way. It's a completely human response to a lack of social connection. So I think, I think we shouldn't be scared of loneliness, but at the same time, we should be very vigilant to make sure that people do not dr um, fall into constant loneliness, a, a loneliness that lasts for weeks, for months, for years, that feels unending, and it feels like there's no hope. So I think it's a really important issue. We should all acknowledge that we feel it. We should all not be scared of it, but we should really be vigilant in making sure that we're helping other people not to fall into the, the position of constant loneliness because that's where it has a really, really terrible impact on people. Decía que la soledad tiene evidentemente un elemento subjetivo, ¿no? Todos percibimos mm, yeah. la calidad de nuestras relaciones sociales y la de nuestra propia vida no solo con los elementos reales ¿no? o objetivables de esa situación, sino también por cómo cada uno de nosotros lo, lo vivimos. La mayoría de las personas que acaban eh, padeciendo la soledad no deseada es porque no son conscientes de que la sufren. Eso que decía usted ahora, eh, de que no hay que dejar pasar eh, o ignorar las situaciones de aquellas personas que pasan días, semanas... Mm -hmm. Eh, meses y se acaba convirtiendo en un problema, en una dificultad enquistada. Mm. Es porque nosotros mismos a veces no nos damos cuenta de que estamos solos o no queremos darnos cuenta de que estamos solos. I think I think there is maybe it comes from the stigma, but I think maybe there is a lack of awareness. Um, 
you might feel uncomfortable in a social situation. Um, it's possible to feel lonely in a room full of people that you know. Um, and that might make you feel uncomfortable, but you might not call that discomfort loneliness. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's something you need to kind of be aware of, um, maybe to take that first step. And, and certainly people who are who have been lonely for a very, very long period of time, they can be really vulnerable in a number of ways. So when we talk to other organisations who are working with people that may be at risk, we, we tell them to go gently, um, to, to be careful about that, because, because people have to build their self-confidence up from quite a low level often, um, and that's, that's something that takes time, um, and it takes encouragement, and it also... It also means they have to really pull on their resilience um, and remember other times they felt lonely and how they've got through it, all of those kind of things. So I think, I think there's, there's a lesson there for people when you're when you think, looking at people and thinking, oh, they look like they might be lonely, is not to try and act on that judgment, but just to be friendly, just to be open, just to ask a question and start a conversation. Um, and that's often a really good starting point. It's, it's often those small interactions, and there's a good lot of evidence on that. Small interactions with strangers on the train or you know, just, just in a shopping centre or a cafe um, will really boost somebody's self-esteem if they are feeling lonely, and then they will be more able to take that next step or to forge that next relationship that will help take them away from feeling so lonely. Sobre esto que decía, le, le he leído eh, hablar de, de las barreras arquitectónicas, casi, ¿no? de las barreras que tiene el, nuestro diseño de las ciudades. Eh, eh, decía ella, insisto en algo que, que le he leído, que la gente se tiene que acabar relacionando en un bar, yeah. consumiendo algo, porque no existen bancos en las calles donde eh, nos podamos sentar a establecer una conversación con un desconocido. Le tengo que decir que nosotros somos vascos y estas cosas nos cuestan un, un poco. No solo tenemos un tópico que es que no ligamos, pero también nos cuesta mucho, digamos, sentarnos a hablar si no hay un motivo, una mesa o algo, eh, un menú delante que lo, que lo impulse. Pero me parecía curioso eh, cómo hay aspectos ¿no? sociales que influyen en en la soledad y en que podamos sentirnos solos que no nos percatamos de ellos. Y efectivamente no hay bancos en las calles donde nos podamos acomodar a establecer una conversación con un desconocido. Um, it's, it's interesting you say that because I think the British probably have a very, very strong reputation for being very, very reserved and not wanting to talk to people. Um, so um, I think we have the same challenge. La británica y una vasca estamos hablando hoy, esto está bien. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing I'd say, I mean, I've only been, I've only been here in this city for 24 hours, um, but I think in, in Britain we historically had a culture of you could go to a pub uh, on your own, you could order a drink, and, and you could, you know, you'd have a chat to somebody else, and that wouldn't be too strange. Um, and, and pubs are closing now, and pubs are changing, um, and increasingly you have to go in and you have to eat a meal. And if you're on your own, that can feel like a huge barrier, like you feel very exposed sitting, eating a whole meal on your own. And the observation I would make is, is your bars here are quite amazing because you can go in and you can just have a morsel in the same way as you could have a pint and, and you can have a conversation with someone. And, and that's, that's a really special thing, I think. Um, it's given me some ideas to take back to the United Kingdom. In terms of <laughs> in terms of street furniture, and this is this is a real goes back to user centered design. This is a real bugbear of mine. So um, increasingly in in England and in London in particular, public spaces are becoming less public. Um, the developers will move in. They'll take out public seating, or it will be quite uncomfortable seating in, at bus stops and stuff like that. And, and I think that makes it hard for people to stop and talk to each other, but it also makes it particularly hard if you're old and, and, and slightly compromised in your movement, or if you're disabled, um, you might choose. So I, I, know, I know people in my family who just basically will not go to the shops anymore because there isn't an easy toilet to go to, or there isn't an easy place just to sit down without actually spending three or four, you know, three or four pounds on a coffee or a tea and a piece of cake. And so, and so, Without, we're designing 
cities, we're designing public spaces that exclude people. And I think that's one of the things we need to look at is how can we design inclusion and how can we design people coming together better. Relacionado con esto, eh, estamos más solos en un mundo globalizado. Eh, la dilución de ecosistemas que nos han ayudado a construir nuestra vida desde niños, como los barrios, las comunidades de vecinos, eh, a veces con tan mala fama, pero bueno, que formaban parte de nuestra vivencia cotidiana, eso se ha ido eh, diluyendo, cada vez hay más gente que vive que vive sola, quiere decir que, que no tiene a nadie con quien compartir su vida, que tampoco conoce a sus vecinos. ¿Todo ello está contribuyendo a hacernos más solos, personas más solitarias? I mean, the research, the research shows that we're not necessarily feeling lonelier. That seems to be quite static. Um, but I think we're feeling lonelier in different in different ways. Um, we did a poll recently um, in Britain that showed that 80% of British adults felt that there was a less of a sense of community than there was 20 years ago. And, um, and I think, you know, there have been huge changes in those, those 20 years. There's been massive changes demographically um, and just in terms of an aging population, in terms of lots of people moving both within the UK and, and outside of the UK as well. Um, and I think there's been a bit of a breakdown of some of the social structures that kind of keep neighbourhoods together. Um, and, and I'm sure we will talk about social media, but I think the social media question, it, it, it can also be an echo chamber. It, it, can, it can just be a way of talking to the people you already know rather than the people who are on your street. And, and I think when people move so quickly nowadays, you also have to just keep an eye on who's in your street. Who are the people who are physically there? If something happened to you, who would be the person who might help water your plants when you're on holiday or feed your cat? Or who might have a spare set of keys if you're anything like me and you forget your keys sometimes? <laughs> that those kind of connections are really important. You don't have to be best friends, but it's really important to foster that sense of belonging where you live. Mm -hmm. Luego vamos efectivamente con las, con las redes sociales y el mundo hiperconectado, pero primero, uh, por empezar desde que somos pequeños, ¿tendría que haber una especie de asignatura que nos enseñara desde niños a vivir solos, que normalizara la vivencia de la soledad? Se me ocurre esto porque yo creo que, no sé si ocurrirá en Gran Bretaña, pero aquí eh, hemos pasado a tener un modelo de crianza de los, de los niños. Tenemos menos niños, los padres, por razones obvias, derivado, entre otras cosas, de la incorporación de la mujer al mercado laboral, están menos tiempo en casa, pero a la vez son críos muy hiperprotegidos. Y se me ocurre si no les estamos eh, desprotegiendo para afrontar fenómenos como el de la soledad, que al final es una vivencia que forma parte de la vida del ser humano, ¿no? La queramos o no la queramos, pero en algún momento todos acabamos sintiéndonos solos o nos hacen sentirnos solos, ¿no? Naturalizar esa, esa vivencia. Yeah, I, I think talking about loneliness helps diffuse that stigma, um, so seeing it as something normal, and I think you're, you're right, there is a tendency to overprotect children, so... Um, So, as, as I mentioned, my daughter's 23, but there would be points when it'd be like, you know, I haven't got any friends, and, and you kind of want to dive in and fix it. You want to make everything okay for them. And I think when you have one or two children compared to, as you say, in generations before, five or six children, you have the time and you have the energy to try and fix things for that child rather than let them explore, learn how to fail, and learn how to respond to failure and bring themselves back up again. Um, there's a piece of research that we've started doing, um, and it, we won't know the results of it probably for another two or three months, but this is looking at psychological factors, psychological resilience, and trying to understand why people become lonely and what are the psychological factors that may um, precipitate them becoming lonely, and, and whether there are things we can do to build our resilience. And I think those kind of understanding how people bounce back from setbacks, it doesn't have to be social setbacks, it could be you know, in school or things like that, but being able to have the strength to bounce back and keep trying and persist, these things are really important skills that we learn, um, and, and we probably do need to be more mindful that we are 
encouraging children to learn those skills now because I think with smaller families, with the kind of attention you're talking about, some of those things don't happen naturally as they would in a much larger, larger family unit. It would just be, you know, get on with it. Um, de las estadísticas que, que, bueno, por distintas cuestiones personales y profesionales eh, he podido revisar en los últimos años, hay algún dato que sí que me ha sorprendido singularmente y es el... Hay un estudio de la Caixa al, al respecto, de la Fundación La Caixa en España, que eh, creo que establece que cerca del... en torno al 20% de los jóvenes entre 18 y 25 años se sienten solos. Y claro, tendemos a asociar la soledad sobre todo eh, a los estadios de la vejez, ¿no? eh, al envejecimiento paulatino de la persona, pero hay esos niños que se convierten en jóvenes y se sienten solos. Su hija de 23 años confrontada a una situación vital uh, distinta. ¿Eso cómo se hace cuando uno teóricamente tiene ante sí un montón de herramientas para estar conectado con con el mundo. Es una paradoja, ¿no? Mm. It, it really is a paradox. And um, we're asked all the time about technology and digital social media in particular and, and the impact on loneliness. While we don't work with young, young people, we are, um, we are a campaign about loneliness in older age. I think e e even older people that we speak to um, have always said that, you know, if you ask them when is the point you felt most lonely, most of them would point to that, that time, you know, between the ages of 18 and 24 as the point where they felt most lonely. So I think this is something about how we learn socially as, as human beings. Um, these are the points where we are probably at our most vulnerable, where we feel loneliness most acutely. Um, but there is still time for recovery. There is still time for learning beyond that. So. Again, I think having an open conversation about loneliness, the role that it can play in our lives and the, the actions we can take to counteract it at a young age can help us build resilience for loneliness in older age as well. So I think, I think the two are connected. Um, there are no young people, that, well, there are young people and there are old people, but ideally we will all be young and old at some point during our life. It's the same people. Um, Esperemos we're going que mayores. The sí. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I just. <laughs> Eso es que sobrevivimos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I think, yeah. So, f so for me, there is a there is a distinction between loneliness felt by younger people compared to loneliness felt by older people. But actually, the 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 way we address those concerns is often the same. I think younger people now, this generation, have some very unique challenges. The the very quick rise of social media and how that has changed beyond all recognition, social interaction. Um, even in the last 10 years, people, people who are teenagers now compared to people who are teenagers 10 years ago, it's a very different experience already. And I think we will, we will have to work quickly to understand what those social changes will mean for people growing up today and in the next 10 years as well. Um, interestingly, the British government, while we, we have a loneliness strategy now, it doesn't focus predominantly on older people. In fact, it, it doesn't specifically talk about older people very much at all. The focus is very much on younger people because I think for the, exactly that reason, there is a very strong shift in how um, our social world is, is inhabited. Um, and that, that generation is seeing that change first. So we need to kind of invest and understand and build that resilience in that generation. Las redes sociales, ¿qué tienen de bueno y qué tienen de negativo? O eso también es muy personal, depende del uso que hagamos cada uno de ellas. I think I think any technology, any technology will always depend on how you use it. Um, so there are some really good things about social media because because in order to make social connections that are meaningful, one of the best things you can do is join a group or meet people who have similar interests to you. Um, so I'm a big fan of knitting. So I will actively seek out knitting groups on social media or in person. 
but usually social media first because it's easy and I can do it on my way to work and it doesn't take much time. But then I will follow that up. I will follow that up and turn up and I'll see some real people one day doing some knitting and we'll, we'll do something together. So I think social media as a way in to creating social relationships or a way in to finding other people that are interested in the things that you're interested in is invaluable. Um, I think the other role social media has, you've talked about globalisation and, you know, I have, I have family and friends all over the world now in almost every continent apart from Australia. So actually being able to keep in touch and see what's happening. I won't, might not see my cousin or I might not see my brother-in-law for five years, but I will see the, the key things that are happening in their life through Facebook and they'll see what's happening in my life. So when we do meet up, there's a sense that we've kind of lived some of this together, even a little bit distinctly. And I think those, those are really positive things. I think on the negative side, and there is a huge negative, and I, and I think in particular the generation that has grown up um, almost unsupervised. We didn't really know what was happening with social media at that point. Um, I think social media has created intense social pressure to be a certain way, to look a certain way, to live a certain life, to have food that just looks beautiful all the time when you take pictures. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a real correlation, not with loneliness so much, but with mental, mental illness and anxiety in particular. So I think, I think that is the negative. And so this is why I think the, the challenge for loneliness and young people is very much tied into technology. How do we understand the technological interface and how we can minimize that impact and actually make sure that the positive benefits of things like social media and other technologies are, are what's focused on. De hecho, las redes sociales se están convirtiendo, se pueden convertir en una herramienta no de inclusión, sino de exclusión. Uh, a mí me resulta preocupante. Yeah. Yo no soy madre, pero por lo que veo a mi alrededor con, con hijos de amigos, uh, cómo el grupo puede operar antes te señalaban en el patio del colegio, todos hemos sido niños y hemos conocido la maldad infantil. Pero ahora, claro, te, el señalamiento es a través de grupos de WhatsApp, a través de Instagram, uh, eso se multiplica exponencialmente porque la conectividad es mucho más acelerada y más amplia eh, y eso puede precipitar casos de soledad temprana, ¿no? de adolescentes, antes yeah. hablábamos de los 18 años pero incluso de adolescentes que se sientan prematuramente solos en un entorno Much que younger. no necesariamente tendría que serlo ¿no? Yeah, and, and, and again I think this is, this is where you see the UK ministry looking in particular at loneliness and bullying together because I think the two, the two start linking in quite early, in the early years mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Yo solo estoy en Twitter no tengo Facebook, no tengo Insta, como dicen ahora los modernos. Eh, ¿Qué me estoy perdiendo? The other way around. <risas> ¿Qué, ¿Qué me estoy perdiendo? Aparte de lo del punto, pues que bueno, tengo una madre que hacía punto, con lo cual estoy más familiarizada con eso. ¿Qué me pierdo? Oh gosh, I didn't. I'm, I'm here to defend social media. Um, well, I don't know. Like I say, for me, it is just connecting with other people in the world that I wouldn't see otherwise and just seeing what's happening in their life. Um, I do know other people, friends of mine, um, who've come off Facebook, for example, because, because it made them feel jealous all the time. It made them feel as though their life wasn't as good as someone else's life. So I think it, it's a personal <laughs> thing. No sabían hacer punto. Y hablemos un poco del amor. Se supone que el amor es lo que... El amor... Eh, nos blinda ¿no? eh, ante la soledad. Antes los amores eran eternos, aunque no fueran deseados, ya no son eternos. Y ahora eh, uno acaba consiguiendo el amor a través de cauces eh, no habituales. Ya no te sientas en el banco a intentar hablar al desconocido de al lado, sino que hay otros mecanismos. Eh, son formas de amor diferentes que también nos pueden ayudar a combatir la soledad. Hay que aceptarlo, que hay nuevas formas de... De igual conocer a la, al hombre, a la mujer de tu vida. Well, I think I think we have to, <laughs> we have a phrase um, in the campaign which is about safeguarding the convoy, um, which is you know love is wonderful, it's fantastic. If you if you have one person in your life that you have that really special 
um, intimate bond with, that's amazing. But we also know of people who are in relationships and who are married who feel very lonely in, in those relationships. And um, so I, th I think um, love isn't necessarily an antidote to loneliness. It's, it's just another context. Um, so I, I, think, I think the important thing is to recognize that that if you are in a relationship, or even if you're not in a relationship, um, we will all deal with loss at some point. And that might be loss of a parent, it might be loss of your spouse, or your life partner, um, or, or a really close friend. And, and that, that loss isn't any the less for the type of relationship that that has come from. Um, so I think, uh, going back to what you're saying, how do we know who's lonely? How do we find who's lonely? I think, you know, if you know people who have suffered a bereavement or suffered a loss, then they're probably going to be feeling quite lonely. They're going to they're have a real gap in their life at that point. So being kind to them and just being thoughtful for them is really helpful. So, um, yeah, I don't think love's an antidote, but it, it, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sí, si aciertas, sí. Si aciertas, es una cosa estupenda. Eh, hablábamos del duelo, que es uno de los episodios digamos, que podemos identificar más con el riesgo de la soledad. ¿no? La pérdida de alguien que es importante para ti, no solo una pareja, puede ser un hijo, puede ser un padre, una madre. ¿Hay otros episodios equiparables al duelo? ¿Se puede pasar un duelo por la pérdida de un trabajo, por ejemplo? Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, loneliness, um, especially with men, um, and especially sort of the older mm -hmm. generations, this may change um, when men are taking more time out now to look after children and raise children. But, but certainly the research that we've seen is unemployment, redundancy, and retirement are real trigger points for feeling lonely, and in particular for men, because men tend to use their workplaces as their social networks um, and, and their outside of workplaces tend to be managed by their female partners if they have one. So, um, so yeah, no, that, that can be a huge loss to somebody. And, and not just a loss in terms of social connection, but a loss in terms of personal meaning and, and a personal sense of purpose. So I think with all the transitions we're talking about, like the young people going off to university or changing city, um, bereavement um, and and with redundancy or losing a job all of these challenge our identity you know you know this is me I'm a professional or you know this is me I'm a married man or this is this is me I'm a child becoming an adult when our identity is challenged that's that's I think a real risk time for feeling lonely because we're not quite sure who we are and so it's hard to form connections when you're not quite sure who you are yet so those those are real Those quizás are real porque, danger points. Quizás porque identificamos más lo que somos con lo que hacemos que con nuestra identidad. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. And and some of so we work a lot with lots of different organizations that work with older people and some of the people that I've met that really are thriving in later life, you know, like full of energy, full of you know, lots of lots of amazing things going on in their lives. They're generally people who either have carried on working or who do quite a lot of volunteering. So they're sort of like really putting themselves back out there. Um, and there is something about a sense of meaning and purpose and, and how that helps us form our identity. Um, ¿Hay una soledad distinta en los hombres y en las mujeres? Hay una tipología de la, de la soledad. ¿Lo pasan peor las mujeres que los hombres, los hombres que las mujeres? ¿Es más estigma para ellos por el peso histórico de esa masculinidad que no les hace hablar de las cosas íntimas, de su intimidad? ¿Tenemos nosotras más recursos, aunque vivamos más tiempo solas, ¿no? porque la, la supervivencia es mayor? ¿Tenemos más recursos que ellos para afrontar la soledad? ¿O eso también es, eh, no sé, es un prejuicio, es una idea preconcebida? I tend, I tend to always think, um, I always try to avoid generalizations on gender, but uh -huh. I think, um, I, I, and I've seen research that looks at, at this in every single way, so I don't think there's anything conclusive. I think there is a lot of research that suggests that women tend to have richer and wider social networks than men. Men have narrower social networks and... If, if they're married, they often access social activities through their wives. 
Um, and so in, in both cases, but, it, but it, going back to the thing, loneliness isn't like, you know, it's not like you need 10 friends in order to not be lonely or one, one husband or whatever. It really is very individual. Calidad, it really, yeah. Quality and quantity, and it depends. So some people might want quality, some people might want quantity. It's, it's, it can vary Can't person by person. So even when you're talking about all men or all women, there will still be some people who will, who, who will be very different from that because um, you know, a woman might have a very, very rich social network, but she, her, her need for social engagement might be really high that she still feels very, very lonely. Um, there may be you know, a man who has recently been bereaved and feels absolutely desolate at that loss um, and, and isn't quite sure how to get back. So it will, it will always come back down to the individual. And we do a lot of work talking to individuals about what, what is their experience of loneliness. And I think one of the things, going back to your earlier question about surprises, is, is just... You know, we're, we're all very different as human beings. We're all incredibly different. And we all get more and more different with every year of our life. And so when you're talking to someone who is 85, the, 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 their experience of what they're experiencing is going to be so much more different than my experience of loneliness now. You know, so we get richer in our experiences as well. So I think men and women, I think there are differences and there are those those different types of prejudices, I guess. Um, but there's not enough commonality to actually draw a distinct conclusion. A conclusion general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ¿Tenemos características personales que nos predisponen a ser más solitarios? Os decía antes, yo soy antropóloga y creo mm. que somos seres sociales, pero igual todos no somos igual de sociales, ¿no? Yeah, no, no uh, we're not all equally sociable. So I'm quite an introverted person. Um, so, so, so I, I always like I could do with a bit more solitude in the positive sense. Um, but I think, I think there are different characteristics, and this is what we're trying to look at with our. Perdona, le gustaría algo más de soledad. Yeah, ¿Ah? but not loneliness. <laughs> not loneliness. <laughs> Um, so not loneliness, mm -hmm. um, but solitude in the solitude. positive sense. So um, I can't remember the question now. No, si hay gente que tiene eh, más oh, características yeah, yeah. personales, más predisposición yeah. a, la, a, la, a ser solitarios, a la soledad, y a llevarla peor. Yes. So, so again, I mean, this, these things can be formed. They can be partly personality, like whether somebody is quite introverted or extroverted, whether they feel social or, or, or are quite antisocial. All of these things will form what people want from their relationships. And also other things, like what kind of family you grew up in. Um, there was, there's one man that we've worked with, his name's John, and he used to be in the RAF, the Royal Air Force. And um, for him... He, he liked lots of people around him because because the army gave him that structure. It gave him it gave him a brotherhood. It gave him a very a very wide social network, um, and that was very very important to him. And he described the periods when he stopped working as being really really desolate, almost like a bereavement, as you suggest. So, so these different things make up for that. I think there are also psychological responses or characteristics that can help. Um, and again, this is the research that we've only just started doing, but it does look, you know, if you tend to, if you tend to look at things that go wrong in your life as accidental, um, and therefore, you know, you can't necessarily control them, then, then that might be a good thing. If you see them as something bad happens and it happens to you and it's almost like it's happening because it's you, then that kind of, that kind of attitude can be more negative and that can make you feel more lonely mm -hmm. in a negative way. Ser un lastre. Mm -hmm. Actuar como un lastre ante situaciones imprevistas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. ¿Y qué condiciones eh, sociales, económicas, influyen más en la, en la soledad? Es decir, la pobreza, las dificultades económicas, la discapacidad, lo mencionaba usted antes, eh, son elementos que contribuyen, que están tasados, que contribuyen a aumentar la sensación de soledad. 
So I think I think disability and sensory impairment, absolutely, because um, it can, you know, th those can, kind of conditions can really limit what you can do and how you connect with people. Um, hearing and sight uh, are, are really quite fundamental to communication in so many ways. So so if you lose your hearing or if you lose your sight, that can be that can be a, a real a real problem. Um, likewise, mobility because it. it impacts on your ability to go other places and to meet other people and you're much more reliant on people coming to you not always the case in terms of poverty um i think there's there, there it, it what it, what it can do is it can make a bad situation worse i don't think people become lonely because they they have experienced poverty but if you are lonely and you experience poverty it can be much much harder to get out for the same reason, it becomes an obstacle and it becomes an exclusion factor. Um, but you know, we've we, we, again we know people who are you know incredibly wealthy in financial terms, but may still feel very very lonely. It goes back to the fundamental human being part of it. It's nobody's nobody is immune. <laughs> Vayamos con el Ministerio de Teresa May. Yo le tengo que confesar una cosa. Eh, cuando lo escuché dije, esto es una ocurrencia. Esto es una ocurrencia. Eh, porque lo lógico es pensar que la soledad es un problema, si lo consideramos un problema social, o lo hemos identificado como un desafío mm -hmm. colectivo, esa conversación nacional de la, que, de la que usted hablaba, o que usted defiende, yo decía, esto tendría que ser algo transversal a todos los ministerios. No sé si crear un ministerio de la soledad no es asumir el fracaso colectivo de que desde distintas áreas no hemos sido capaces de afrontar antes el problema o de identificarlo. I think I think yeah, it's it's, it's really interesting. So I think the the ministry ministry for loneliness sits it's it's complicated. Um, it sits within the Department for Digital, Social, Culture and Sport. Um, and, and for us, when, when this was announced, it was, mm. seemed quite a strange placement. But actually thinking on it more, it, <laughs> <laughs> it becomes quite interesting because it is things like digital, media, sport and culture are some of the activities that bring people together. Um, and one of the things that the minister, we, we, we've had three ministers now, so it's not just one, there's been three because there's been so many changes <laughs> politically. <laughs> But they've all been the first one in particular, and and you know they've all been very good and very committed. But they work across all the other departments as well. So the strategy that was developed, the, the loneliness strategy, isn't just a strategy for that department. It is a strategy that has commitment from health, that has commitment from the transport department, and has commitment from Department of Work and Pensions and nine other departments basically. Um, I think you're right, though. I think there is a real risk because because it cuts across so many government departments, and like any government, there are so many different political pressures and bids for resources that the other people, you know, the the um, the ambition or the commitment um, to, for loneliness is not as strong in some departments as it is in others. Um, I would say that um, in the health department, in particular, it's incredibly strong which is very, very helpful. Um, so in the NHS, we've now got a new, a new mechanism starting called social prescribing. And that's, that's not just about loneliness, but loneliness is one of the, one of the things that's looking to tackle. So, and I'm sure it's the same in primary, primary care, you have lots of people coming to the doctors with things that are not particularly wrong with them, but actually there's a lot of other things that they could benefit from. So, um, it could be physical activity, exercise, it could be walking groups, reading groups, social activity, um, craft groups, there's my knitting again. Um, and, and, and now we have a system whereby um, within your GP surgery, so it wouldn't be a doctor, but it would be like a social prescriber, could actually talk to these people, understand a little bit more about their motivation, understand a little bit more about how they could benefit from different types of activity, and literally write them a prescription. And instead of a prescription for a drug, you would have a prescription to go to, I don't know, um, a reading group 
and, and you would go to the reading group and you would see how that went and, and maybe that would work. So, so the NHS is quite committed to trying this kind of process over the next few years um, and I think that's really, really helpful. I would say, though, it's probably come off the back of you know, five, well, more than that, five or six years of very, very strong austerity measures where a lot of community services have found it very, very hard to fund themselves. So it's going to be quite difficult, I think, to, to pull together a list or you know, an understanding of all the different activities that people could be prescribed and then to map them through. Just because you have a prescription doesn't mean the activity will be there. And you know it, that would be really good for somebody who is struggling to make friendships and wants lots of friendships, but for someone who 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 has you know lost their life partner and that's what they've lost and that's what is making them feel lonely, it's not going to address them, or it won't it, it won't address somebody who is feeling so low in terms of confidence that you know they, the last thing they will want to do is go to a group activity. They will need a much more considered intervention in order to kind of counteract their loneliness. Eso implicaría eh, médicos de atención primaria que supieran identificar eh, que quizás determinados problemas físicos tienen que ver con que uno se siente solo, uh, con que el sistema tenga esos prescriptores para restar farmacología al tratamiento y aplicar otras medidas. Pero se me ocurre que sin esa conversación nacional, sin esa convicción colectiva, mm -hmm. sin ese compromiso ciudadano, va a ser más difícil abordar el problema. Es decir, si... Yo no detecto que mi vecino del tercero, pues hace tiempo que no le veo, hace tiempo que no sale de casa, eh, está taciturno. Eh, si yo no percibo eso y no doy la voz de alarma, es probable que no consigamos avanzar en determinados terrenos. ¿no? En eso hay que recuperar un poco el sentimiento comunitario, el sentimiento del compromiso con los demás. ¿no? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's absolutely key. Um, and my own experience when I was much, much younger was my, my father was a community worker and it was all about the community. You know, we would we would go to youth clubs, we would go to community groups all the time. Um, and actually, you know, I look back on that and I, and I think that was really quite wonderful. Um, I'm quite committed within my own community now, but I think like many, many people, especially people like in London, um, you feel quite pressured in terms of time to make that, to make that connection. Um, obviously, doing what I do now, I've, I have made the effort to make sure I know who all my neighbours are. And as I said, I forget my keys quite often, and, and they're always there for me with my spare set of keys. And I look after their cats when they go on holiday. So, I mean, I think all the time it's about trying to understand that all these relationships should be reciprocal. In order for them to feel meaningful, they shouldn't be motivated out of pity or, you know, Compassion, compassion, yes, but not pity. Um, and and so actually, you know, some some of the some of the chance encounters we might have, some of the some of the long-standing relationships we might develop with um, one of our neighbours who we hadn't spoken to in five years, they should be as beneficial to us as they are to them, and and they will be if you give them time to flourish and you you make the effort. And um, and I think we have a long way to go to recapture some of that. Um, but I think it's really important. And there's some really interesting research that, that we've seen, which is when you talk to people about having a conversation with a stranger or somebody you don't know at a bus, most people are absolutely terrified. I don't think it's just a British thing. It's kind of like, oh, my God. Um, and, and most people think, oh, they don't want to listen to me. They, you know, they're quite happy sitting by themselves. I'm quite happy sitting by myself. Um, but there's a no numerous experiments which show that two things. Number one, the people who think they're happy sitting by themselves and then have a conversation on the train with someone are actually much happier after they've had that conversation, despite them thinking they wanted the solitude. Um, and the other thing is people who thought that the other person wouldn't like them, the other person likes them a lot, lot more than you think they're going to. So, so there are some real positives there. We have quite low expectations of our own social interactions that sometimes get in the way of making those effort. But the research is there, and the research shows you know, our expectations can be a little bit higher. We can, we can do this a little bit more without, without it being painful or awkward or embarrassing. 
Se nos está acabando el tiempo y a mí me gustaría que le hicieran preguntas del público, pero no me resisto. Esto es de formación periodística, me va a perdonar. Oigan, con esto del Brexit, sabía yo que esto iba a gustar al auditorio. Eh, con esto del Brexit, ustedes van a tener isolation, loneliness, eh, ¿cuál es la palabra exacta de, de, tu, de su amplio vocabulario? Se van a, no se van a sentir ustedes más solos. Nosotros les vamos a echar de menos. I, <laughs> I already feel lonely. Um, I, I, um, my personal view is I think it's a terrible, a terrible idea. And I think, actually, whether you support Brexit or whether you're a Remainer as a British person, I think the one thing the debate has happened in the last three years is it's pushed everybody further apart. It has made it much harder to have conversations, um, not just about Brexit, but, but about all sorts of things. So, so, I, so I think the Brexit debate is a bad thing because we're not moving forward at all. Um, and I think it, it's Está crazy. Y está contaminando otras cosas, otros debates sociales. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, people, people, are, I would say one, one thing is people sometimes are scared to have a conversation with someone because they don't know how they might answer the Brexit question. Will it be different from my view? And so these, it, it becomes a real division, a, a real point of division. And, and what we're talking about, what we're campaigning for is, is ways to bring people together. So, so whichever way, Whichever way, whichever opinion you have on Brexit, my opinion is it's a bad idea. Um, it's still a bad thing that this debate continues. It's yeah, it's very detrimental. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, we've got another video. Those videos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should I do, do you want me to do? I know we were almost out of time. This is the second film which Joaquin was keen for me to show. Yeah? Two minutes. And it minutes. basically, it just shows that awkward conversation talking to strangers in a supermarket. Oh, goodness. Right, to squeeze in, is that okay? Oh, yes. Thank you very much. Hiya. Hi. Hello. How's things today, anyway? You all right? You on your lunch break? Is it a good sandwich? Was it as good as you were hoping for? And more. And more. What's your name? Andy. My son's called Andy. When you're having your snack, do you find many people talk to you? No. No. You're not a talker, or...? No. no. Never have been. Nobody talks to me because I'm old. And have you tried the prawn sandwiches at other shops and then? No. You're not going to risk it? No. no. I'm just having a chat with people. Yeah. There's a lot of people who are lonely in Britain. But if I said to you, nine million people in the UK were lonely, what would you say about that? I find it, I find it incredible. I didn't realise it was as big as that. Something needs to change on me. Making small connections every day is a way to help people combat loneliness. When normally you'd just be sat on your phone or whatever. Yeah, yeah. If you can just have little moments talking about prawn sandwiches, chat's free. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you may have to give a little bit of your sandwich. You know, just a smaller <laughs> amount. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I'm nearly 90, you know. You look fantastic. I oh, know. <laughs> it's good to talk. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like my friends are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you get a chance to make those little connections, then that'd be, yeah. I feel I might just go for a little walk around at some point today yeah. and actually say hello to someone. I'd almost say it's been a pleasure. Well, almost. <laughs> almost. You may see some people on my right hand side who are now having a chat. Yes. Who weren't having a chat earlier. I'm not even sat there pressing it Bueno, pues la tienen aquí. Anímense. Sí. 
No, le van a acercar, le acercan un micrófono. Hola, ¿se oye? Sí. Bueno, eh, yo la idea que tengo es que la soledad está muy ligada al orgullo. Entonces, eh, el estado del bienestar provoca individualismos, comunitarismos y orgullo. Y el orgullo creo que es lo que nos impide mucho la comunicación. Y me extraña que en esta charla no se haya comentado sobre ese tema, porque al final estamos hablando una, viendo a una persona que se sienta en un centro comercial, deja a un lado su orgullo y empieza a comunicarse con distintas realidades. Gracias. So, so pride isn't something we've actually looked at, but I think um, probably the closest thing we've come to is when we're talking about gender and men, women in particular, is looking at male gender and um, what we call in Britain the stiff upper lip. So not wanting to recognize their own emotional experiences or not wanting to verbalize them and look weak. So I think, I think there is some correlation there. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure quite what you meant by the welfare state and individualisms and things like that. But I think one of the things we found is, as our welfare state in the UK has become has had less funding go into it, some some of these issues have got much harder. So the poverty bit has played in more. But that's I think that's quite different from what you're talking about. Bueno, no sé si puedo eh, seguir. Eh, has empezado hablando de que tenemos menos sensación de comunidad en el Reino Unido. Mm. Yeah. Y eh, bueno, lo, 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 cuando hablo de individualismos o comunitarismos hablo de eso, es decir, que cada uno hemos adquirido una serie de verdades políticas, religiosas, sociales, económicas, culturales, y nos cerramos en esos comunitarismos. Eso es lo que yo quiero decir. Y mm. eso es lo que yo estimo como orgullo. Yeah. ¿Alguna más? That makes, that makes sense. Aquí. Hemos hablado de la soledad en los jóvenes. Just one minute, just move there. <risa> Buenas tardes. Hemos hablado de la soledad en las personas jóvenes y en las personas mayores. Pero yo entiendo que hay una soledad, sobre todo en la adolescencia, ligada con el bullying en los colegios, que en ocasiones se vuelve trágica. Y la persona que se siente sola se ve incapaz tanto de hablar con los profesores, con sus padres, con sus compañeros porque tiene el grupo que le ataca, que si habla con sus padres o habla con, con los profesores, todavía le van a dar más. Incluso se han dado casos de, de adolescentes que han cambiado de colegio y les han seguido al otro colegio. Entonces, yo entiendo que ese tipo de soledad es una soledad muy trágica, que no tiene nada que ver con la soledad que estamos hablando quizás, pero me gustaría saber tu opinión. And I I I think it, I think it is incredibly tragic. Um and I think it's on the rise. So um outside of the campaign work, I'm a trustee of a, a series of schools in London, um elementary schools, so up until the age of 11 and we do a lot of work on peer mentorship. Um, so that's basically training children within the school to keep an eye out for children that don't have friends to play with in the playground, making sure that they've got people to play with in the playground, or if they're not playing with people, that they're quite happy doing what they're doing. So I think it's something that schools at a young age can help with, but I think it does become particularly difficult once children hit that age, 12, 13, 14, and it can be really, really vicious. Um, I, I think it's for exactly those kind of reasons, for example, that the UK government, when they're looking at loneliness in children and young people, 
um, now that they are focusing on bullying in particular. So I, I think that link at a policy level has been made in England, not necessarily in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We have a, a mix of government systems, but that connection has been made. Um, and I do know, like I say, a lot of good work that happens in primary school up until the age of 11, but I think at secondary school it can be much, much harder to tackle. And again, it's, it's, it's a very difficult one. I think it's something that requires not just the school taking action, but actually a wider conversation so that those children feel supported by that wider conversation happening. Sí, bueno, yo preguntar, ¿una buena autoestima puede ayudar a combatir o a prevenir la soledad no deseada? Absolutely, because I think um, all the research shows that if, if people have good self-esteem, they are more likely to be able to go out um, and make connections or to maintain the relationships that they have. When people's self-esteem takes a blow, it can be very hard to even maintain the relationships people already have. So the two are absolutely linked. So. Which, which is why when we talk about people who have constant loneliness, that actually going to a social group is not necessarily the first step. That could just be overwhelming and very, very frightening. We need to look at smaller steps and smaller interventions for people who have been lonely for a long time. Eh, hola, buenas tardes, Kate. Eh, bueno, la soledad es un tema complejísimo. A mí se me ocurrían un montón de preguntas, pero... Mm. El, el espacio da para lo que da y bueno, voy a plantear una pregunta porque, que tiene que ver con nuestro trabajo diario en el teléfono de la esperanza mm. de Ipozcoa eh, tú has hablado de los pequeños gestos, ¿no? de esas interacciones pequeñas, diarias, mm. que hacen que la gente se sienta mejor se sienta menos sola se sienta que pertenece a una comunidad eh, nosotras y nosotros en el teléfono nos encontramos con personas que quizás sí tienen esas interacciones pero lo que no tienen son relaciones eh, íntimas, eh, significativas, mm. eh, profundas, comprometidas, eh, con, con personas con las que puedan compartir situa situaciones difíciles de su vida. Entonces, claro, eso entiendo que requiere de otro... O sea, las, las pequeñas interacciones diarias son importantes, pero no suficientes ¿no? Yeah. para alcanzar este tipo de situaciones que son con las que más a diario nos podemos encontrar... En nuestra, en nuestra entidad. Entonces, no sé si estáis trabajando este tema o, o cómo lo veis o... No, so, so I think there's a number of different stages and absolutely, so what people want is they want close, meaningful relationships. And so the small steps are a way to build that or to create a climate um, or a context where those can happen. Um, Again, I think most relationships are best when they're reciprocal and everybody needs somewhere to go in a crisis. So I think the work that you're doing at the Telephone of Hope is, is uh, fantastic. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting that so many people are phoning about loneliness in particular. I think um, one of the things that, not the campaign, because we're a campaigning organization, but our host charity is a charity called Independent Age, and they work on some of these other intermediary steps, different services. So they have befriending services, which happen either face-to-face -face or telephone, and that might be that somebody has a call once a week, if it's a telephone um, service, or they might have somebody go and visit them once a week for two hours. And it's, and it's quite tightly prescribed. It's, it's a two-hour, there is special training, safeguarding, protection, those kind of things that happen. But um, quite a lot of effort goes into matching the volunteer with the person who is experiencing that loneliness. And what, what we found is that those relationships become genuinely reciprocal. It's not just the volunteer giving their time, but they also have somebody that they can talk to about what's happened in the week and, and that they become really strong friendships and, and really quite sustaining from an emotional point of view. And again, then they can be the point of contact to other people in the community and can hopefully bring people into a more active relationship with the rest of their community. Thank you. Thank you. Nada, muchísimas gracias por su 
por el diálogo ¿no? tan interesante y tan fluido. Eh, personalmente me quedo un poco con ganas de saber un poco más de su organización, eh, de qué tipo de actividad realiza. Entiendo que es una organización voluntaria, de voluntariado. Me gustaría también saber qué relaciones mantienen con las administraciones y luego en relación a la estrategia, eh, me gustaría también saber en qué condiciones está en este momento ese proceso de consenso de cómo identificar o cómo definir la soledad en base a tres, cuatro preguntas en las que deberíamos de tener un consenso internacional para poder comparar este, eh, digamos que tan subjetivo fenómeno como es la percepción de soledad, que como bien sabemos, pues en función de cada estudio, pues sale una prevalencia diferente. ¿no? Por lo tanto, creo que uno de los grandes avances de la estrategia inglesa es precisamente el hablar de que nos tenemos que poner de acuerdo en cómo definimos la soledad en cuanto a cómo yeah. preguntamos a las personas cuando si se sienten o no se sienten solas y demás. No sé cómo está en este momento esa situación y también pues eh, eso, me encantaría saber un poco más de su actividad y de intervenciones eficaces, ya que nosotros estamos trabajando en esos asuntos. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Um, we're a campaigning organization, so I'll ask that the kind of activities that we do are not activities directly with people who are lonely. So we, we, we talk to people who are lonely, we talk to people in older age quite a lot to help inform our work and to help make sure that we're taking the right direction. But um, mostly what we do is we work with national government, local government, health authorities and other organizations that are providing services and are looking to do interventions And we also work with researchers um, and policy makers to try and make sure that we've got collectively a really strong evidence base for the best interventions that will have the most impact. Um, and you're absolutely right about measurement. Um, if we could have an internationally um, agreed standard, that would be unbelievable. I mean, it's been very, very difficult to get a nationally agreed one, and we still have some dispute about it. Um, the measurement device we use is the UCLA3 question, um, and, that's, and that's been recommended by government purely for the reason that you're talking, so that you can, act, you know, th you said, um, so that we can check like for like, we can compare how things have had an impact. Um, but there are still many organizations that find it quite hard to ask those questions. And there are different questions that have been recommended in different places, depending on the kind of activities that are being offered. So I think we're probably a long way from that kind of consensus. Um, I would just very briefly add as well, um, at, at the campaign, we don't just talk to people within the UK. We have talked quite a lot to researchers outside of the UK and to other governments and other organizations. So, so th this visit here to the Basque country is one. Last year, um, a member of our t team came, I think, somewhere else in the Basque country, and we've talked to Catalonians and people from Madrid in Spain, um, and in Denmark and Norway and Sweden. So there's, there's, there seems to be quite a collection of activity happening in the Nordic countries and quite a lot of activity and interest in this topic in Spain, which I think is really, really heartening. It's really, really good to hear. Okay, thank you. A mí me gustaría, eh, para, quizás para cerrar, primero agradecer la, la presencia de todos ustedes aquí, la participación. Eh, yo creo que ha quedado claro que tenemos que cuidarnos y que tenemos que cuidar nuestra sociedad. Creo que ese es para mí el mensaje más importante. Creo que es cierto que cada sociedad es diferente. La soledad es algo muy personal y cada persona lo siente de su manera. Pero cada sociedad es muy diferente, como se ha dicho repetidas veces. Y creo que es muy importante el definir en cada sociedad cómo es la soledad, cómo se debe acometer, cuáles son los factores que influyen. Y eso es precisamente el esfuerzo que vamos a hacer mañana, juntando a todo este colectivo tremendo de Guipúzcoa, pidiéndoles que nos ayuden a definir cómo estamos aquí, qué es lo que tenemos que hacer, qué es lo que cada uno quiere hacer. Yo creo que esto para mí es el mensaje principal de esta conferencia. Es personal, es colectivo, es diferente. Lo que no es diferente, creo yo, 
es la sensación de calor humano que nuestros dos ponentes nos han dado. Eh, eso no es diferente. Yo no me sentiría nunca solo con ellas dos, les puedo asegurar. Así que muchísimas gracias por su presencia, su colaboración. De verdad, muchas gracias. No se olviden, por favor, de devolver los, los aparatos en la puerta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you.